Good evening and welcome to Psychedelic Healing. I am your host, Sonia Cotto, CRNA nurse anesthesiologist and mental health advocate. Welcome to Psychedelic Healing. Tonight, we have a wonderful guest, Dr. Xenia Thomas. She is a licensed child, adolescent, and adult psychiatrist on a mission to transform mental health in the most reliable and natural ways possible. After practicing for 15 years in a conventional setting, she realized there were limited tools and resources to provide lasting change for her patients suffering from mental health conditions. In 2017, she opened Radiance Float and Wellness in Missouri, providing natural treatments to attain mental wellness, including float therapy, cryotherapy, infrared sauna, and red light therapy, among many other options like nutrient therapy. She then introduced CBD and legal THC into her practice. These natural and plant-based treatments have been instrumental for so many of her patients to regain their mental health. Ketamine-assisted psychotherapy and psychedelic-assisted psychotherapy were the next additions to her practice, utilizing IV and intramuscular ketamine and has seen positive transformations in her patients. She has recently moved to Florida, very smart, burr, in April of this year, and she founded her new clinic, Live Well Apothecary. Welcome, Dr. Xenia. Thank you. Thank you, Sonia. So great to be here. Yes. Well, welcome to Florida. I'm glad you made the smart move uh, from Missouri. (laughs) Yes. It is so nice to be here. Sunshine State. Oh, yes. You haven't even experienced the winter yet, so you will definitely appreciate it. (laughs) Yeah. The next couple of months. Yes. So I know when we first met, I really was drawn to your real holistic approach to mental health. And I love the implementation of cannabis into your practice uh, when we talked about medication management and patient struggles, getting off medications, tapering off meds is what our first conversation was about. You really have transformed med management and utilizing cannabis and those who practice with cannabis are, you know, doing patients a great service, you know, to try alternative methods. So I did want to kind of go into more detail of like how you've been able to implement cannabis and and CBD into your practice. Thank you for asking. It's such a, it was like an evolution, really. I would say in, you know, I've always, even in psychiatry, I was like always wanting to try to make it better. You know, the pills were only, you know, maybe 30% of the equation. And, you know, what can you add in to to help the, the whole person? Even in maybe 2012, I did some aromatherapy certification and was trying to see if, you know, maybe I could add some essential oils along with pills, you know, with, with kids, lavender or something like that. And learned a lot about terpenes. And so that kind of filed away in my head. And then when I opened Radiance, a lot of we focused on nutrients, you know, giving your body the nutrients it needs and maybe it can heal itself or kind of fix things that are are deficient. And with IV therapy, you know, you can heal a lot. But then when people are coming to me saying they use CBD for, you know, getting off of benzodiazepines, getting off of antidepressants and helping them sleep. And I was shocked. I maybe heard of it a little bit, not much, I mainly THC. And then, of course, we were all taught, you know, it's a drug of abuse and has no medical value. And so it's just kind of that's filed back there, too. And, you know, it's almost like you can't even talk about it with patients. They opened my eyes to to the remarkable abilities of it. And so started using CBD with great success and getting people off of, you know, just like they were talking about benzodiazepines, uh, antidepressants, especially those, uh, you know, those brain zaps people would talk about. um, So far eyes, maybe in my head, they were like mini seizures and happening. um, And CBD is kind of a natural, you know, treatment for that. And even even the FDA does know that they as they approved Epidiolex, a, a seizure medication, CBD, and it's pretty much just a CBD isolate. Oh. But um, yeah, so that was a real eye opener for me. And and then when it was um, medical in Missouri, th- you know, that that came naturally in my practice was sort of opening up the door for people to use cannabis and especially to treat their mental health. And that was also eye-opening for me because actually I am I'm a child psychiatrist and so I saw a lot of you know children self-medicate 
And then I would go through that, you know, a motivational speech and, and that it's not good. And then, you know, for the developing brain, there's probably more or, you know, harms and good. And they always got into these legal problems as well, which I was like, yeah, that's probably the one of the biggest side effects of cannabis is the exactly. legal issue. And so it was, but but then when it became legal and you are able to see, wow, this really does help people's anxiety. Um, they're able to function much better. People even say focus or ADD symptoms are gone away. Their sleep is, you know, hugely better. And most of the time when you can get a good night's sleep, most of your anxiety and your mood problems, you know, go away as well. So that was really, really amazing to see for me, especially when you were taught that almost the opposite. And so that was kind of nice to be able to, you know, kind of not use so many pharmaceuticals and and then people be happy really on follow-up appointments instead of kind of complaining about all the side effects. Uh, but then, you know, it definitely has its sort of limits or maybe what I've noticed is that if they start cannabis for one symptom like insomnia, then they may still have issues with their PTSD and their depression and other issues. And so maybe cannabis alone is not enough. And and then where do you turn to? And that's kind of when I was hearing a little bit about ketamine. This may be back in 2018 and it wasn't it was very still kind of reserved for just treatment resistant depression, maybe similar to like ECT, like, oh, you don't use that unless you, you know, really need it. And I think there was not a lot of psychiatrists, you know, even doing, you know, touching their patients, let alone doing anything invasive. But we were set up with the IB clinic and nurses and I was like, yeah, bring it on. If it can help mental health, you know, let's, let's try it. The first couple treatments were just mind-blowing amazing and and they would come out of their session and uh just you know just talk about these epiphanies i was like no way this is not possible it's not happening in my office and yeah. and it, a remarkable and it just never phases to uh, never stops to amaze me um the the insights people can get Right. Imagine all the work that you do and like with psychotherapy and all the different therapy sessions and hear the epiphany, the the light bulb moment can go off yeah. in a, a 45 minute infusion, you know, in their right. own mind. Right. Cool. right. And historically, especially even with children and adolescents, it's, it was even harder to come by those epiphany moments, you know, mm -hmm. very hard to just articulate. And this medicine makes it just so easy to talk about, you know, yeah. things that have been bottled up. So do you do um, an actual uh, ketamine assisted psychotherapy like during infusion or how is it when you do how how is your psychotherapy sessions with ketamine? Yeah, um, they've also evolved somewhat throughout um, my, you know, my experience with it. You know, really, I was, I was trying, trained by anesthesiologists who would kind of, you know, are very familiar with the medication and have used it for many years. Uh, you know, decades, but maybe at, at one point he was like saying, oh, if they're talking, you know, maybe it's a little too much. Let's like turn it up. And so then maybe you miss a little bit of the uh, emotion or the, you know, insights that they're getting. Uh, so I kind of really wasn't, I was just sort of let that infusion happen, let this transformation happen, let them explore, you know, let them be out of the room. But maybe beforehand, you know, start preparing. Obviously, it's the set and setting. And the set, I say, refers to your mindset kind of going in. And, you know, people who would come to me would have been on the gamut of antidepressants, especially for treatment resistant depression if they're getting ketamine. You know, they've tried everything. So there may be a little like, you know, what's this going to do? This is so expensive. This is not going to work. This is just going to be like that thing. So we, we I try to clear that, keep an open mind. You know, this is unlike any other medication out there. It, it really doesn't work on anything that we've been used to. Kind of really try to hone on that neuroplasticity that we can grow our brain. And so we're, we're doing actually something so beneficial. And then maybe setting in that intention that, you know, your answers will come to you easier when you sort of you know, put them out, put the out there. And so you know, spend a little bit of time setting an intention and then they get the infusion and then the nurse monitors all their vitals, but they're pretty much let to be post, you know, we give them a sense to, you know, gather their thoughts, uh, maybe journal. And I think that is where the real magic is, is um, maybe that day, maybe the next day, if you can kind of talk and then 
put together it integrate really what that means what you experience and what it means for you in the coming you know days and in your coming future i think that's where transformations happen yeah no oh, so much so much mm-hmm. yeah usually i've seen like within 48 hours after infusion i always tell all my patients if you have your own therapist see the therapist schedule with our integration coach you know, because we actually provide integration coaching at home, like either phone or video, um, but we also do integration in office as well. Like that is is key is to really yeah. process what you experienced. Yes, I'm so glad you do that. I think that you're the perfect example of bridging the you know the medical, the anesthesiology with the psychiatry. I think that is so needed. So that's the, awesome. Thank you for doing that. Oh yeah, definitely. I love it. I love it. I'm not in any way trained in psychology or anything, but I do, you know, do more of, I'm more of like the life coach, you know, preparing. Cause imagine the, when you've been suffering from depression for so long, you really are just living day to day, just dragging the past with you and just struggling to survive. And then all of a sudden with ketamine, you have this relief of this depression and you're like actually in the present moment and you can actually look forward to tomorrow. But you're like, you don't even know how to look for towards tomorrow because you've never been able to look to today, let alone right. the future. So that's where like my role is in the coach. But then we have like integration and therapists and stuff. The, nice. uh, the actual good stuff <laughs> that I don't really know about. Yeah. Yeah. Well, no, that's so important. So important. Mm-hmm. And it just makes it just, I, I feel like lasting and um, j- yeah, just seals the deal on the whole package. Yeah. I'm curious because if you use the cannabis, do you actually, have you ever used like cannabis, like as a psychedelic assisted psychotherapy, like having a therapy session with them on cannabis? Not necessarily, but I feel like that would be a really good addition to some of the ketamine uh, retreats. Some people when they are using or they feel like that's a very grounding medicine cannabis. So maybe after a ketamine session where it's you're kind of dissociative and floating, at that maybe prior to the integration circle, I think that would be a very helpful tool to kind of bring down, get grounded, and then talk about your experience. Yeah, I feel like I feel like the microdosing, you know, kind of started with cannabis too. You know, just people can kind of take a little bit to just relax and and talk more. I feel sometimes people feel like it's um, you know, they get sort of silent, but I feel like they're taught thinking in their in their brain, working things out. And especially with their anxiety. And then they can kind of, I feel like ketamine gives you a lot of information to talk about. So if oh, that yes. is the case that you just don't talk much, you will be able to verbalize a lot better. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but I do like, I mean, makes you talk a lot too, because mm-hmm. I know in the, it takes about 10, for IVs, it's like about 10 minutes to feel the medicine. So in the first 10 minutes, you, you're talking, I'm talking to the patient and then they start talking more and start opening up. And I'm like, oh, you didn't tell me this in my assessment, you know? They start talking more and more, and then all of a sudden they're like, "Okay, I'm going to close my eyes now," and then they okay. go into there. Right? Okay, yeah, that's yeah. yeah, that's good. I feel like that those you know few first few minutes, right? Their anxiety is away from them, is you know dissociated, and they're just like spewing things without fear, and yeah. and so sometimes that's not nice to get that out. Will you do psychotherapy on them as well, or do you have another person that does the psychotherapy? We did. We. Um, do both. So I guess it depends on what it was. So now since I'm here in Florida, I'm mainly doing the the home treatments, the nasal and the oral uh, RDTs. And it's the same thing. We'd have like a virtual um, prep session and a virtual integration. Sometimes it works with me. And then uh, otherwise I have a, a, a cap therapist that I work with. Oh, nice, nice. I've been he- yeah. hesitant to implement that at home um, just because I've known of a lot of like abuse potential like i've seen it and um not necessarily my patients but like when i've heard it there's i guess more so in miami and then i know in california there's a big abuse of ketamine so i'm so okay. hesitant about doing that at home although i know it's so beneficial because it's ketamine is expensive to do it in a clinic having all the the to be able to just pay for everything just to pay for the service and doing it at home like this i guess at least prolongs the need for infusions, but have you noticed any abuse? It, you know, I feel like it's it's less than it's thought to be. I mean, of course, there are going to be some of those, you know, 
party users. But I feel like a lot of people, even with even when you hear about the psilocybin, they may have started to do it as a recreational dose, but they really had a lot of transformational healing. Mm -hmm. And I think probably ketamine is the same way as that, you know, may, say, say, maybe they tried it on the party scene, but they almost felt so good or it helped them in, in some way that they want to try to emulate that or, or you know, get that re results again. Mm -hmm. And so I think when you really think about the, you know, one in three people, one in three adults are on antidepressants and an addiction is, you know, maybe 50 percent. I feel like it's, you know, worth using this as a treatment since it, the efficacy is so good, 70 to 80 percent for depression uh, remission. And I think the Johns Hopkins study said about 86 percent remission. Yeah. Without, that's huge, too. And so I feel like, you know, that harm reduction model we could we could try and at least write the home treatments get you can more people can access access it than going into yeah. a clinic. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. I always tell patients, I mean, even though I don't do that at home, I'm always however you can afford it, what you need is ketamine in your system to process, to have the psychotherapy and just really work through the trauma. And that's why I think psychedelics is the future of mental health because it's a way to open that window to just get yeah. deep down and heal those wounds, you know? Yes, yes. And what about, what do you think about microdosing ketamine only, like not having the journeys? I know that there's a chemical benefit to it, right? Because you have the rebalancing, the anti-inflammatory effects, but how, I don't know as far as like the dosing, I wouldn't even begin to fathom like the dose that you do for microdose to be able to function to be able to drive, to be able to, to yeah, function during yeah. the day in that sense. I know that somebody's developing like a, a patch, ketamine for pain, mm -hmm. a patch that could go behind the neck that yeah. would be non-psychedelic, but would actually be a pain relief. Um, so that might be possible. I just don't see otherwise how people could work with uh, ketamine on board. Well, I feel like the microdose, even with the nasal spray or the lozenge, um, the, you know, they come as low as 50 uh, units and or 50 IUs and then uh, milligrams and the, and maybe the oral is only about 20% absorbed. So maybe you're getting about, you know, 10 milligrams. And yeah, so that's like nothing. That's nothing. Okay. And the same with the nasal spray. I think it's each about 10 or 15 migs per spray. And um, people say like one or two sprays will get rid of a panic attack. And maybe rivals them like a Xanax, you know, kind of give them that chill feeling without, you know, m making them impaired. I do feel like you have to get, uh, you know, also you can kind of fight that threshold of leaving, you know, your body and kind of stay it in with, especially with a low dose. And I think some of the theory, you know, like a tenth of the, the tenth of the therapeutic dose is the, you know, microdose sort of, um, you know, range, and maybe that's what you know, SSRIs are and antidepressants are. It's just a microdose of, of a, you know, thing that if you take every day over time, you're going to get the benefits. And I think I, with with ketamine, you it's probably more realistic because of that neuroplasticity. And like you said, the anti-inflammatory effects. You can reduce inflammation and grow the brain. You're probably going to have better results with um, mental health, mental illness than, than the Band-Aids that we're used to. Right. But I think that even with the microdose too, it's important for, you know, our my listeners too to know that you gotta have psychotherapy with it. You gotta have therapy, C B T, whatever it is that you EMDR, you know, because otherwise it is a continual band-aid, you know, for symptom relief. All those that have been suffering for years and years, sometimes we just need the band-aids to get through until we can get through the real healing. With with cannabis for microdosing, what kind of dosing is that? Like how low is, you know, I usually kind of educate people. So the here in Florida, you can have a flower and a separate allotment for the manufactured products. Usually about every inhale of flower is about two milligrams. And then every inhale of a vapor concentrate is maybe double that, about four milligrams. And so, you know, obviously you start low, go slow, but sometimes even two, you know, the same thing, microdose is kind of a tenth of a dose or something that you're not supposed to feel or it's more sub-perceptual. I guess that would okay. vary on people to people, but I would say even, a, you know, like a novice, exp novice user 
would even one one or two hits would make them impaired. So I mean, exactly, <laughs> yeah, really slow um, for for that. Or maybe you know, smoking is not kind of like and smoking is maybe similar to like an IM injection. You know, it's going to kick in right away um, with ketamine yeah. and, and and last for some time. So maybe using like a sublingual or an edible form is maybe that gradual onset. 30 to 60 minutes and then maybe if you take like a 2.5 i've seen those like 2.5 mints that may be a more of a micro dose because it's over six to eight hours as a as a edible or a mint rather than you know smoking which is over an hour or so so yeah probably the form take into play when you're microdosing uh something like cannabis i introduced i uh, interviewed an author that she actually used like the microdosing of the cannabis to help treat her endometriosis, like hey. severe, severe chronic pain, you know, having to be on opiates to yes. and control the pain, but then being able to come off of everything and do microdosing of cannabis. That's help amazing. That. That's amazing. And it's, it's also when you, so with any G, you or GI issue. And so also you don't have to microdose, you can mega dose with like suppositories and get a lot of medicine in there to sort of, you know, get the whole area, the local area, especially you no know, with pain, without actually impairing you. Uh, you know, it doesn't really get into your regular blood circulation. It goes. They the have suppository and everything. So you know, it's hard. It's crazy on the uh, Florida registry. It is one of the options that we can check. They none of the dispensaries have them yet. I'm on this other Facebook group where people are teaching people how to make them, like make their own. So you get the RSO or the distillate from the dispensary and then put it in coconut oil, cocoa butter in a mold. And when you say RSO, what does that mean? Uh, it stands for Rick Simpson oil. And Rick Simpson, okay. It's oh, I'm a, familiar with that. Yeah. Something with uh, cancer treatment, right? Yeah. Yeah, so I believe it's like the full spectrum of the plant. And so they have so a lot of cannabinoids, a lot of terpenes, like just all the good stuff. And you, they say to start with just a grain of rice. And people say they start with that and it just um, just heals their body. I had another, just recently they put it on their skin cancer and within four weeks, three, four weeks, it was gone. Wow. It, that blows my mind. So, so doing suppository or on the skin, you actually don't get high. You don't get high, um, especially at yeah, topicals. You won't enter the bloodstream, but you'll get a lot of local benefits. Mm-hmm. And same thing, you know, in the vag- vaginally or rectally, it will enter the bloodstream, but not the bloodstream that goes to your head. We have more of that portal circulation, so you kind of get the whole GI tract clean. Okay. So, what kind of disease processes would be? For it's like the rectal or vaginal, see what kind of like prostate cancer, colon cancers, um, endometriosis. I've heard fibroids being shrunk, shrunk, um, and then even, people also say even just the you know C- CBD is just kind of a you know pleasure. You know, get some in- increased libido and just enhance your everyday pleasure. So it doesn't have mess. Yes, it's uh, <laughs> for fun too. Wow, I've been ne- I've learned so much. Mind is blown already. With uh, um, I, I thought I knew so much about CBD and THC already, and now boom, something new. Yeah, amazing. I feel like that that one is what, suppository is one of the, one of the better delivery methods that you can use for for that, especially if you're treating something like cancer or something like you just need a lot of medicine without and and still need to function. Wow. And then how do people find that are the Rick Simpson oil? Well, that's, you know, the dispensaries. So you would just purchase that and then make your own suppositories. I've heard people using that in edibles. Like they they just didn't want the, they want a little bit more potency from the edibles in the store and maybe not all the sugar and all that stuff. So saying, you know, the RSO and their own, and maybe butter or oil and making their own foods. A little bit more control. Yeah, Yeah, that's when I see a lot of, dispensaries now they have all that stuff and now you're just toxifying your body with all that sugar and processed you know the corn syrup and all of that so it makes it difficult yeah i I feel like they have some options but right it's not that they still have cookies and you know brownies you know this is not necessarily real medicine yeah yeah 
Well, yeah, you have the option either you smoke it, so you don't want to smoke it and damage your lungs. Even with like the the vaporizers now, right? The the oils, like they're still right. there was that big, you know, incident with all these uh, e cigarettes. But how do I know? Is it controlled with all these oils? What is it doing to our lungs? You know. I feel like that's not as um, a concern as like e-cigarettes or, you know, nicotine and and those kind of flavored juices. Typically, they'll take the flower, you know, the the, the essence of the flower and then just, you know, once you press like marijuana flower, you'll get that sap or honey and that's what they use. And I think back maybe a couple of years ago, they were the ones that were adulterated with, um, you know, off the streets, adulterated with vitamin E or something like that. So I think dispensary quality are going to be very good. They're tested. And and right, it's probably, there are some cannabinoid receptors on the lung. Um, when you look at studies from Israel, they they say they do use it. You know, there are certain terpenes that are bronchodilators. And so they have used um, them for asthma treatments even. But yeah, it is more of that pure vapor form. Nothing like combusted, nothing you know, irritating, and and probably also just kind of slow hits on the on the baby. You you see some people just getting so irritated, coughing so much that probably is too much of a you know big big hit. And mm. wow, oh, that's so beautiful. Mm-hmm. I love all that stuff. Uh, so interesting. interesting. So you, um, when I had approached you, I was having a client that I was trying to help. Um, off of like benzos, you know, I mean, it's an amazing medication to help with anxiety, but long-term use, we have patients that become anxious more so because of the benzos. It like causes this refractory. So, but then there's the problem of trying to come off of it. And you actually have tapering methods that you've been able to help patients come off of it with CBD. Yes. I know that historically, even in my practice, it was scary to have, you know, benzos, withdrawal seizures, and and then just even just have nothing to to work like Xanax. It's really even hard for like to replace like clonopin with something like Xanax, and you know they don't have that cross tolerability. Um, and so when I um, and someone told me about the CBD first, I don't know if I would venture to try it on my own, but I think because of its own seizure uh, anti seizure properties, CBD and THC, when you have that on board, you're gonna prevent to some degree, you know, a withdrawal seizure from the benzos. And still I would recommend to taper it down. You know, I didn't um, follow this girl directly. She just, she said she stopped it in a week, but I would probably recommend like 25% decrease of the benzo with more, you know, CBD. I heard something that I liked, you know, use as much t- CBD as you can afford. It's, it's pretty pricey, but it's, uh, it's non- non you know uh, psychoactive and it's probably going to just calm or bathe that nerve and help with anxiety and then just use as much thc as you can tolerate there is some psychoactivity to that when you put it to with cbd it's it's also muted so you're not gonna have too much but what can you what should you use to not even need that xanax or benzo anymore and and so you do want to get that anxiety relief from there but but, you know, pretty quickly, I would still, you know, say to go slow, but I feel like that is one of the best ways to get off of that. You just mentioned now that if you take more CBD, like, so you have THC and CBD side by side, mm-hmm. right? Uh, CBD doesn't have the psychoactive, the THC part, so you aren't feeling stoned. But so if you add more CBD while taking the THC portion, it numb, it like subsides the subsides the impairment. Yeah, there's I read something that like the THC goes into the CB1 receptors in our brain, and but there's something about the what CBD does. That CBD doesn't really act on the brain, but it kind of maybe dislodges the C, the THC off the CB1 uh, receptors, and so they say that can kind of bring down the high. So if someone's getting a little uh, feel like they were too high, too you know. Much cannabis um use cbd maybe in the same form and so if they smoked it try to inhale the cbd because that'll kind of be quicker if they had an edible maybe try you know maybe try the smoking just to get some relief quickly but um maybe try that edible so it it could sort of buffer uh the whole way uh through the metabolism 
That is so cool. Something else I learned. Light bulb, and, light bulb. <laughs> yes. And I feel like when people, when you use them together, they work better than using either one alone. And it allows you to use it during the day. You know, then that's another way I've been able to come off of medications. You know, most of our medications are designed to last 24 hours, you know, but with Prozac, Zoloft, you just have to take once a day. Whereas cannabis is really not designed to last more than, you know, an hour or two in the smoking form. And then edibles do tend to elongate that, but still maybe only about six to eight hours. So how do you recommend, you know, replacing a 24 hour medicine uh, and then yet, you know, being still awake to function? And I think that's by adding. And so I usually say a one-to-one gummy, like at 8 a.m. and 2 p.m. And then you can probably use just THC at night for 8 p.m. And the sleep is so much better. And so how do you work it with your pediatric patients then? Because I'm sure it's very healing for like ADD, right? So- yes. Yes. Um, yeah. You know, I it's it's in Florida. And there's there's a lot more restrictions on getting a minor their card, whereas in Missouri it was a little bit lax. But um, but yes, I definitely think that it could be so helpful. What I've also ne- known in my child psych is that most people are self medicating, so at least you know get you know, the legal protection, get that legal you know coverage. But you're right. If there were kids talking to me, I there is a comp- there is studies from Israel that says eighty uh, CBD and THC combo gummies are very effective for ADD. And then there's a certain terpene. And, you know, it's, you know, I, actually Florida does not allow minors to smoke, but they will allow some vape products. And, and there's a pining terpene, which is, gives people that in that zone, focus, attention span, maybe a little bit improves their memory. And that's found in things like Jack Herrera and Strawberry Cop. And when you say those like term, those strain names to a ADD, um, they're like, I love Jack Herrera. That's my favorite. Mm-hmm. And then they really say they get into that zone. And so it is really nice to to hear that there's that the science and then it plays out clinically as well. Yeah. Yeah. I actually um, spoke with another um doctor that specializes in uh, Dr. McKenzie here down here in South Florida. And they have patch that you can actually have on, on kids, right? And that's with the mm-hmm. CBD, THC, so you don't get the the stoned effect, right, with students okay. in school. Uh, patch, a patch may be transdermal, so you may get some of that, but but with the CBD added, probably not. Right. Yeah, so that, that would be a great option for kids. That would be a good option. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Wow. I've learned so much from you, Dr. Xenia today or Dr. Z. You like, you like to go by Dr. Z, right? Well, I say he's a can't, a zine is a flower just like cannabis. So I was like, I'll go by my first name. Oh, less formal. <laughs> yeah, mom, that's beautiful. Yeah. I love it. Well, I have learned so much. I'll probably have to have you back on and to learn some more on all this stuff. That. I would love that. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for the work that you've done. And you are based out of Orlando now, correct? Yes. Orlando, pretty much serving all of Florida, you know, because with the virtual visits, doing the ketamine, do events all over for the cannabis cards too. Oh, beautiful. So perhaps in the future, if I become unscared to work with uh, at-home ketamine, I'll uh, come and give you, a, give you a call and we can maybe work together and have you uh, work with that. Great. That would be awesome. I love that. <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much for joining me tonight. And thank you at home for joining us on this week's episode of Psychedelic Healing. Everyone have a beautiful night. Bye.